Uh, hello. Hello, my name is John Robertson, and I am going to be performing a speed run of Ryan North's book, To Be or Not to Be, A Choosable Path Adventure by Ryan North, William Shakespeare, and you. All right, I'm just going to I'm gonna move the camera off so you can see my face when I do this. I'm going to set some ground rules first. Uh, rule number one, I'm going to go through the main storyline because there are a couple storylines that can end after two pages, which is kind of cheating in the situation because then what's the point of doing a speed run? Okay, rule number two, this is not going to be tool assisted in any way, in any way uh, so like I'm not using bookmarks or anything, just normal copy of the book. Though I might do a tool assisted speed run just using bookmarks to cut out the time it takes to flip between pages. You know how it is. Uh, so yeah, basic copy of the book. But I'm going to be doing the main storyline as Hamlet, so I'm going to be taking every skull option. I know there are some ways that you can do, uh, that you can make a shorter path using the uh, non-skull options and then going back to the main storyline. I haven't quite figured those out yet. In a later video, I will probably attempt to do that or something similar. Anyways, let's get to it. So, yep, here it is. I'm going to be having the book here. Camera like this. You won't be able to uh, very well be able to read the book, but you will be able to see it happening and know that I'm not just reading from a script or something. This is from the actual book. <coughs> Alright. So, take one, starting from page zero. Alright. William Shakespeare, 1564 AD, to whenever he died, was well known for borrowing from existing literature when writing his plays. Romeo and Juliet was pretty much lifted entirely from Arthur Brooks's poem, The Tribal History of Romeo and Juliet, due to even change the names. And, the result, uh, and as recent Shakespeare po uh, scholarship has established, the, the famed play William Shakespeare Presents Hamlet was lifted wholesale from the volume we we're about to enjoy, To Be or Not To Be. To Be or Not To Be is both the earliest recorded example of the books' game genre, as well as the first instance ever of the, uh, the then newish English language that was kicking around an inventor book being chosen by you, the reader. We've gone ahead and added an illustration. Plus, we've taken the liberty of marking with tiny oryx skulls the choices Shakespeare himself made when he plagiarized this book back in olden times. There, there, in case you wish to put yourself in Shakespeare's shoes, reading this book as he did, stealing plot elements wholesale and classifying languages he eh, and classing up the languages he you won't go. However, this is not the only way to read this book. Feel free to explore other options. As each time you read this book, you can go on a different adventure. Assuming you don't read the book, uh, let's see, shoot. Three zero zero one one eight eight one eight one four three nine zero nine four five two five. That's a number, like full number. That's not just a bunch of digits. Times at which the uh, at which point the adventures will start to repeat, and they'll be seem, uh, seem pretty familiar long before then. Anyways, so uh, now take your back to his. Now take yourself back to history and ghost walk the earth and nobody knew velociraptors were even a thing. Steal yourself to experience the magic of Shakespeare as it was meant to experience. In a non-determined man's sake, a narrative structure where you end up thinking maybe you made a wrong decision. So you mark the pages just you were just on so you can always go back and make a, a different choice if you die for some dumb reason. To be or not to be, that is the adventure. Ryan North noted Shakespeare scholar slash enthusiast. Okay, choose your own ch uh, character show into page four. Okay, page four. You've just been born. Congratulations. Good work on that thing. Now, surprise. Babies are boring, so we're going to jump ahead in a time, uh, to a point in time, uh, to a point where you're an adult and you've already lived a bunch of your life. But I promise most of what you're skipping over was really dull. You ate a lot and slept a lot and made some friends. Tears were shed. Make outs were totally had, etc. It, uh, it was a bunch of high school stuff. The awesome stuff starts now. So, let's begin, friend. I'm who, uh, I'm remind me who you, uh, you are again. Ophelia, she's an awesome lady in her late 20s with a calm, confident, and resourceful demeanor. She's got a plus one bonus to science, but she's also got a minus one weakness against water, so heads up. Damn what? He's a He's an emo team in his early 30s. Also, he's the Prince of Denmark. Hamlet was... Hamlet has a plus one resistance to magic, but there's no magic in this adventure, so this never gets mentioned again as of now. Hamlet Sr. He's the king of Denmark, 50 years old. He's super good at fighting and leading men into battle and naps. Let's say plus one to each. Look, bottom line, he's an unstoppable machine of death, and you should play to, uh, choose to be him. You may experience King of Glory. Okay, page 22 is play as Hamlet. Page 22... Fumble, fumble. Uh, you are Hamlet. You're 30 years old and you're back living at home, but it's okay because your home is a castle. That's right, ladies, you're a prince. Things have been rough lately. You've been trying to focus on your studies at Wittenberg University, where you and your bros were raised to grow some crazy guild and stir all hang out, but, you're, uh, but you were called home because your father died. Then your dead dad's brother, Claudius, married your mom, Gertrude, two weeks later. Yep, it's made you kind of upset. You raised home to comfort her, but you just married your uncle, and that is where you feel weird. Right now, you're in the audience chamber of your father's castle here in sunny Denmark. King Claudius is here addressing his court. Laertes and Polonius are here, too. Laertes is kind of a jerk, and Polonius is his father. Polonius is also the father of Ophelia, whom you're totally sweet on. She was not here, though. Who knows what adventure she's having as you speak while you're stuck in this drafty castle room listening to other people talking about their feelings. <coughs> Speaking of feelings, just... Uh 
Just now, Laertes says something about how that Claudius is king and he's attended cor the coronation. Is it okay for him to go back to France? Cla uh, Claudius says, sure. Wait a minute. He'd love to leave too and go back to school away from this weird incest you think your mother's gotten herself into. It's so gross and weird. So you ask Claudius permission to go back to the school, which is page 91. Uh, now you want. You hold, uh, you hold up your hand and open your mouth, but before you can say anything, Claudius addresses you directly, calling you his son. On the one hand, that's entirely appropriate, especially since he has married your mom like two weeks ago, but on the other hand, he has brought creepy uncle to new heights. Point to that, maybe? So you insult him under your breath by saying you're more than kin, i.e. you're related, for, uh, it has to relate more than once now it's with father, son, and uncle, and nephew, but less than kind, it is this relationship you're in is unnatural. In real life, people think of zingers like this on the spot all the time, so this totally makes sense. That's 317. Uh, shoot, 317. Most of this is going to be flipping in between pages. Okay. He straight up ignores your zinger. Well, shoot, turn to page 181. Well, that was useless. I could probably have gotten to that in a different way. Whatever. Keep going. King Claudius goes on to tell you in so many words to buck up, stop dressing in black, stick around for a while, and have a little fun. He, say, eh, he says all these feelings you're having are boring and wimpy. Your mom echoes the sentiments. Dude, your own mom just called you a wimp. You agree to stick around in Denmark for a while, then leave. Eh, eh, they leave, and suddenly you're alone. Woo, you're finally alone. I'm, what are you going to do? Uh, you're going to... I know this is a faster option, so stand around quietly until something happens. Page 98. This is not a skull option. This is just a faster option. Because it goes the same place. Okay. While you're doing, uh, while you're busy doing that, your friend Horatio bumps into you and tells you, A, he's in town for your dad's funeral, mom's wedding, and they serve leftover appetizers from one to the other. B, goes to Rio. Uh, C, he's seen one and so have a bunch of other guys. D, it keeps happening, uh, showing up at the same time. And E, he's pretty sure it's a ghost of your dad. Finally, some adventure, some closure. You agree to come with him tonight to see the ghost when it shows up again. It's such an obvious decision that it kind of feels like, uh, like you don't even have a choice in the matter. And you don't agree to go to Horatio to see the ghost when it shows up again. That is the only option. I think that's hilarious. Uh, let's see. Crap, I forgot the page. 226? I think it was 226. Uh, uh, yeah. I'll be there 11.30 sharp, you say, and Horatio leaves satisfied. Well, now I have eight hours to blow before it's time to meet Ghost. What do you want to do, Hamlet? Play solitaire is the faster option, so I'm going to take that. Page 99. You, Hamlet, Prince of all Denmark, are now sitting in your bedroom and playing solitaire for hours and hours and hours, which is pretty colossal. Uh, which is a pretty colossal use, uh, wa useless waste of your time, especially since you keep cheating. A five goes on top of a three, Hamlet. Really? Anyway, at this point, we're 15 games in, and wow, if you're not careful, th people might s start saying that your tragic flaw is, I don't know, in action. Eventually, the sun goes down. It's almost 11:30, which hopefully you remember as the, as the appointed hour Horatio told you about, wherein a ghost uh, keeps showing up to bother him. Time to go meet that ghost, huh? So you meet up with Horatio and bust some myths about actual ghosts being real. Uh, please. 359. Uh, you and Horatio go to where to see uh, where he saw the ghost for the first time. Now we play the waiting game, says Horatio. He's interrupted by the sound of trumpets. You look at him and raise an eyebrow. They make that noise to warn everyone that King Claudius is getting wasted, he says. Those trumpets go off every night around this time. He sighs. Denmark, he says. In that exact moment, something insanely cra uh, crazy happens. What the frig? I'll tell you what the frig. A ghost, of here. Uh, a ghost is here. Page 107. E Okay, we are eight minutes in. Well, that's including my intro, so we're doing pretty okay on time. Don't forget, but right now you can. Uh, but right now you're staring cold in the face of good, good, good Spectre. You can't even imagine how crazy this whole situation is. If you're getting too scared, read this next clause over and over again until you're not insane with fear anymore. Everything will be okay. All right. Okay, we can do this. With your last shred of insanity, you quickly glance at the ghost, and you worry that if you stare at the ghost too hard, your brain will realize that it's looking at something uh, so insanely impossible that you'll just black out. Anyway, this ghost you can see through, but only a little. It's weird, and I'll tell you what the frig else. This ghost does look like your dad. He's getting closer. So you don't stare at the ghost uh, too intently and try to figure out what it wants, which is page three eighteen. Okay. Are you my dad? I mean, my ghost dad. You ask the ghost, but it says nothing. Instead, the ghost beckons to you. He's clearly want, he clearly wants you to follow him and leave Horatio behind. I don't know. Is this safe? Can ghosts kill people? Can ghosts uh, kill people? You ask Horatio. I don't know, man, but I really don't think you should go. Uh, you should be along with that thing. He says clearly, have, uh, leaving no on ball, uh, no ball untripped in his freakout. Hamlet, man, something is rotten in the state of Denmark. I gotta say, he yells, his quivering fingers pointing at the ghost. Well, duh. I'm gonna go do it. You say, and you follow the ghost into the darkness, which is two forty seven. It's this way, very close. Now uh, you follow the ghost into the mist. After walking for what seems like forever, you get tired of walking. I'm tired of walking, you say. You sit down. Pretty sure I'm done walking. Yeah, yeah, I'm out. The ghost stops and speaks to you the first time. His voice... Its voice issuing forth from lungs that no longer breathe air. Hamlet, it is I, your father. Look, I can't stay around here forever, so you need to listen to what, uh, what I tell you. I didn't die of old age. I done some digging around, and turns out I was murdered by Claudius. You gasped, shocked and deranged, killed by his own brother. You did it while I slept. I was walking in the garden. You know how gardens are really boring, right? 
yeah, uh, you're not. They're boring for even uh, for even pe for people who like. They're boring even for people who are like, exactly, said Ghost Dad. Well, it was so boring I fell asleep, and while I was sleeping, you poured poison in my ear. I didn't know poisons worked that way, you say. That's what I said, Chester Dad, Sh uh, throwing, his hand above it, uh, throwing his hands above his head in frustration. He, start he starts to pace back and forth. Anyway, uh, anyway, I want you to take revenge on him for me. I don't know, cut, uh, cut him out or something. Pull out his chair when he's about to sit down. Offer him a five five, but when he goes through five, oh, you uh, pull your hand away and say, too slow. Or should he offer you a high five? You must leave him banging. I could murder him, you offer. After all, he is sleeping with your mom. Your, uh, your dad stops pacing and, uh, and stares at you. He's what? Tom, they got married two weeks after the funeral. That's page 105. Well, I'm going to do that. I'm going to take a glass of water. I'm going to drink water there to keep my uh, throat lubricated for optimal. Uh, you say... Uh, you say they got ba uh, married basically right after the funeral, and that makes Claudia's king now. He explained now how maybe it's not technically incest, but the timing alone sure feels quicky. D uh, didn't he ever uh, read the tales of? Uh, uh, didn't he ever read the table of kindred and affinity, wherein whosoever are related are forbidden in scripture and our laws to marry together? You ask your dad. Ah, oh, you say you refer to the document Queen Elizabeth Order produced, which says a marriage such as this one we're discussing is not just quicky, but a real life hardcore sin against God. The book which later made it would sway into the Book of Common Prayer. It's also influential that uh, that we take many phrases such as, such as Till death do we part, and peace in our time from it. The very same, not your father. Although I can imagine that a future sentiments might change as to whether or not such a marriage between two gen uh, between genetically unrelated, uh, loving and consenting adults is among the very worst things it is possible for a human being to do. That's not necessary for us to discuss right now. You agree? Anyway, says your dad, kill Claudius for me. Cool. So you promise to, uh, a ghost will commit murder in the class as he is the verse you can come up with. Page six twelve. Not as far. <clears throat> I think I'm going to stop doing the voices, because they're hard and bad. Yeah, you clearly throw, hold, a, hold one hand open in the air in front of you and promise ghosts that you will kill an alive human. This is what you say. Yea, from the table of my memory, I'll wipe away all trivial fond records, all saws of books, all forms, all precious pasts that youth and observation copied there, and thy commandment is all alone shall live within the, uh, within the book and volume of my brain, unmixed with base or matter, yes, by heaven. Your ghost dad seems pretty cool with that. You have begun to uh, quest kill Claudius. It's worth 3,500 experience points. It's a lot. So you throw in a little sexism for good measure. Page 8. Okay. Uh, oh, more, uh, almost uh, pernicious woman you add, not uh, insulting not only Queen Gertrude, the, uh, the woman your father adored, loved, and married, but also women in general. Science corner. Synonyms, uh, synonyms for pernicious include noxious and pestilence, the, and the word they itself suggests that long-term harm comes from being in contact with, uh, with whatever it's being used to, uh, to describe. Stay classy, Hamlet. Leave it there and return to ratio. Turn to page 111. Uh... Uh, you walk back to where Horatio is waiting for you. Listen, Horatio, never speak of this whole we totally saw a ghost thing, okay? We've got to keep it a secret. That's cool, says Horatio. No, I'm serious, man, you say, grabbing his shoulder. Some really serious stuff is, is going to go down, and I need you to keep this a secret. Swear that you'll never talk about this. I swear, says Horatio. Swear it, booms your dad voice out of nowhere. He already did, you shout. Horatio looks at you, questioning, uh, questioning Hamlet. Bro, what's this about, you say? There's, uh, there are more things that haven't nourished uh, Horatio began than are dreamt of in my philosophy. Horatio finishes annoyed. All right, fine, whatever. Okay, Horatio will keep your secret, and you've got a quest from a ghost to fulfill. And at the end, he'll, he'll, probably, he'll probably give you some cool loot for completing it. Maybe, uh, maybe, I mean, it's possible. Anyway, it's past midnight, and, it probably, and Claudius is probably falling down drunk. What do you do? So do you go call Claudius? You, no, you go home for nappy times, which is page 119. Roll. Okay. You go home and nap. The next morning it rains, so you don't leave your room. Then the next morning after that, the ground is all muddy, so maybe you think you'd leave footsteps that could be traced back to you. And anyways, long story short, several days have gone by and you haven't done a thing. So, uh, let's see. You should go see Ophelia, which is page 259. You go down to Ophelia's place and knock on her door. Who is it, she says. It's me, sweetie, you say, opening the door while stepping down to her room. You haven't seen each other for a while. It's so great to see her. You run up and throw your arms around her and you kiss. It's just like old times. So you hold her at arms like in, uh, length and you look into her eyes. Listen, you say, and then you uh, unbutt your jacket, follow your stockings, take your garters off, and grab Ophelia by the wrist. Yep, that's what you do. Uh, Hamlet is an idiot. But, whatever. Um, okay, you do that. Hamley, uh, Ophelia looks confused during this whole production. What's wrong, Hamlet? Uh, she says, concerned. Why are you uh, why are you fouling your stockings? Uh, you continue holding your wrist and move your other hand to your forehead as if you might faint while staring at her intensely. It's page 208. 
No, no, 308. That's closer. Uh, there, uh, these are some stellar choices you're making, your champs. Okay, you do the crazy things. Ophelia keeps staring at you in confusion. Finally, you sigh as big as you can three times in a row. What do these sighs mean? Ophelia doesn't know. I don't know, and neither do you. It's like, you. it's like you've saved your game earlier, so now you can just do stupid stuff without consequences. But you can't save a game in real life, silly, so now you've got to live with the consequences of these choices. And here's one of the consequences. Ophelia's love for you has taken 15 damage. Lucky for you, she still loves you a whole heck of a lot. Eventually, you run out of sighs and get up and leave, but rather than walking out of the room like a normal person, you look over your shoulder, look her in the eyes, and walk out of the room around the corner without ever making that eye contact. You're lucky you didn't walk into a wall. You know what? I think you, uh, I think you made enough choices for a while. Move over. I'm driving. So you decide to go see what Claudius is up to. That's page 264. Okay. You, uh, you walk in on your mom and fake dad as they're trying to run the country, but it turns out they were talking about you anyways. Polonius is there too. He's, talk hey, he's talking to you like maybe you've touched it, uh, like maybe you're touching the head. Sorry about the dog barking in the background. Hey, he thinks you're crazy. Maybe that's because of all the dumb decisions you've been making. So in an effort to save this, we're going to assume that you were just pretending to be crazy because because that way all of this kind of makes sense and nobody would ever suspect a crazy person of committing murder, right? This is literally the best option we have got left. This is what you've, this is what you've reduced us to. I've gone back and rewritten the story so that when you talk to her issue, now you say, I might act crazy for a while, just to, uh, just be cool. You can go back and check and totally there for turn to page 12. Okay, so it turns out Polanyi considered, uh, considers himself a master riddle master, uh, riddle master, and he's going to ask you three riddles to determine if you're sane or not. Riddle number, uh, riddle the first. Do you know who I am, he says. Since you know you're just acting crazy, this gets a little easier. Normally, I'd give you a choice between a reasonable answer and a crazy answer, but I figure you want to pick the reasonable one just to screw things up, and I swear to God there will be a method to your madness if it kills me. So here are your options. Say, I don't know who you are. Maybe you're a pimp? Or you say, uh, uh, I know you're looking for the option to say, um, yeah, you're, Pol uh, you're Polonius here, but I know you, uh, it's the same one. It doesn't matter. They're both pimp. Okay, that's page 110. Okay. Okay, you tell Polonius that you don't actually know who he is, but maybe he's a pimp. Uh, he doesn't. Uh, he doesn't get that you are, or rather, that I am, rather, uh, rather tra uh, cleverly trying to suggest that you're sus uh, that you suspect he's been trying to mess with Ophelia in order to get to you. It goes entirely over his head. Anyway, he seems uh, satisfied with your answer, which is great. Uh, Polonius puts it to you, riddle the second. What have you been reading lately? He says, tr uh, answer with the exact words I want you to say. Turn to page three twenty one. Uh... That's right, fall in line, baby. You haven't touched a book since you came home from university on funeral slash wedding break, so you answer by making up a book that you've been reading called Old Men Are Gross and Dumb. It's about how old men are gross and dumb. You conclude by saying uh, by saying that Polonius would be the same age of you. A people age backwards? Oh, snap! Polonius agrees that this is probably the case. Finally, he challenges you with a final of his three riddles. Would you like to go for a walk outside? You, you sure would. Turn to page 113. Uh, you moved... Uh, no, shoot. Uh, you say you'd like to go for a walk outside straight into your grave? It's that last bit of crazy that really sells it. Somehow Polonius thinks you're actually saying something really significant about how we're all really dying for the moment we're born. He observes that in madness you're actually speaking the truth. Hey, your answers seem to have helped him reach the conclusion that we wanted in regards to your sanity. Uh... Polonius says you better get going, and, uh, and you say nothing now that would make, uh, and you say nothing would make you happier except if you somehow literally died right now, and that you're mo uh, and then you motorboat your lips and flick your index finger over them, making a <laughs> sound. Yep, he definitely thinks you're crazy. So I hope you're happy. I have fixed this the best I can. Remember, we just are freight crazy now. Okay, okay, you can drive again. As Polonius leaves, your friends Rosen, Kranz, and Gildan start to their What? You thought these guys were still back at university? This is awesome. So you just uh, walk up and say hi. How you doing? It's page nine. Uh, here it is. How have you been, gentlemen? You say, I've been okay, except for, you know, the nightmares. Anyways, what brings you here? Look at each other. Uh, what do you mean that what brings us here? Well, why don't we instead talk about your um, plans and motivations, Rosengrant said. Your face falls. Man, you knew what Claudius said for them. They're here to spy on you. Well, really? Come on, guys. What Were, uh, were you sent here to spy on me? You say, uh, well, yeah. Uh, Rosengrant uh, responds, kind of. Frig, man, I knew what you say. Look, I'll make it easy on you. I know I've been on emo and mopey lately, and even though we don't have the words for it, I'm pretty sure I'm what you'd call clinically depressed. That's all. Uh... They're actually our scare quotes, I'm just, yeah. Anyways, uh, you sigh and then look at them with a small uh, smile. I guess I'm quite the piece of work you right, you say. <coughs> would you like to explain what, uh, that in more detail, Rosencrantz says. You reply, as a matter of fact, I would. Uh, let me just pay one, and page 100. Okay, you were, uh, you were inspired. You clear your throat and hold out one hand in front of you. Look to Ros uh, Rosencrantz and Gilden Cern. And in the eyes, one after the other. What a piece of work is married, you say, choosing the words and punctuation carefully. How noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form and moving, how express and admirable in action, how like an angel, and apprehended, how like a god. 
Ah, your friends nod. Humans are pretty great. The beauty of this world, the paragon of the animals, and yet, to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Man delights not me, you... And break off its golden stern interruption. Gay, he says. I said man's delights not me, idiot. Nor a woman neither, though you seem to think. At this time you're interrupted by Rosencrantz. Asexual, he says. You look at friends. Anyway, whatever. I've been depressed because it's great to see you guys. Uh, but it's great to see you guys. Homophobia and asexual phobia aside. Oh, hey, says golden stern, suddenly remembering something. We met an author on the boat over. We invited her to come, hey, hi, uh, come say hi. An author, this is really exciting. It, and you should walk through the door just as Gildan certain stops talking. Why, well, it's the very author we just mentioned. How perfect. Have, uh, having her show up now and, and keeps this narrative moving at a nice clip and avoids any awkward downtime where you'd otherwise just all sit around in a circle waiting for someone to show up and talk to you. Huh, nicely done, narrator of the story, a.k.a. me. Uh, okay, that's page 10. The option is talk to author. <laughs> Feel free to follow along if you want if you want to do that. The three of you turn and the author get to talking, and she's really great. It turns out she's Christina Marlowe, the author of The Murder of Gonzago, the, uh, 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 the adventure is being chosen by you story. Can you murder your brother Gonzago and then playing as your dead brother's son murder your usurping uncle? I sure hope so. Choose for uh, choose from over 300 different possible endings. It's one of your favorite books, and you tell her so, excitedly asking questions about the character's motivation and how she did that thing with the choices. Now, the, uh, while the four of you talk, Polonius walks into the room and tries to work his way into the conversation, but whatever, nobody to hear likes him. Christina doesn't even make any attempt to include him, and that makes you love her even more. You start quoting your, fa your favorite passage to her. The it's the bit from the back cover, and she takes over and you forget uh, when you forget some of the words. It goes something like this. You were still really mad that your dad was killed by his brother. You decide that you should murder him for revenge, and that my and that, my friend, is a really good idea. You uh, Do you wait to decide to murder him? No, shout you. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern in, uni uh, in unison. Christina smiles. Polonius mutters, this is boring, but nobody cares. Excellent. Then you sleep, uh, sneak into his room at night and stab him in the neck. A huge, uh, a huge fountain of blood erupts from his neck under such pressure that it bursts through the ceiling and forms a glorious red geyser above the roof. Some kid walking by sees the geyser, uh, geyser and says, whoa, and while he's saying the O oh part the wo of whoa, blood lands in his open mouth. It's so awesome. You have earned 1,000 points in the whole, uh, and the whoa kid also earned 50 points. The three of you laugh and cheer and applause while Christina smiles politely and Polonius stands around with his arms crossed. Whatever, I want to wait before I kill them. He grumbles. <laughs> Uh, Christina resented her book with such heartfelt emotion that you actually feel pretty bad about uh, not murdering your own uncle yet. Wait a minute, that gives you an idea. So you, instead of murdering your uncle, uh, your uncle, go grab your copy of the book, then you can get it signed and you can see if you can get Claudius to read it, and then if he chooses the, uh, the murder your brother option, uh, the murder your brother path, and, and then if he looks guilty, you'll know he did it, even though the ghost already investigated and told you he did. Page 85. My voice is good. Whatever. It must be done. Where is it? <coughs> there it is. Uh, okay, but one thing at a time, buddy. First, you go back to the room and get your copy of the, uh, of the book for Christina's sign, which she does. To Hamlet, best wishes. I hope you like to read these words that I wrote on a piece of paper. Cheers, Christina, she writes. Amazing, it's perfect, and now you've got the perfect book to entrap your uncle. You excuse yourself back to your room to flip through Gonzago again. You're absorbed in the adventure, and if you play through, uh, play through Slater, you're convinced. It is a really great book, and it should work perfectly for your plan. All I need to do now is find Claudius. I'm pretty sure these are more at the Royal Court, dude. So you can turn to page 201, or, or 101. Oh, 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 shoot. That was one page over. Uh... You uh, you go to the royal court and it's deserted practically anyways. It looks like maybe Ophelia is there in the corner reading a book, but please, it's not like you have time to make certain. Well, this sucks. You had this perfect plan already, but if Claudius isn't around, then he can't read the book and the whole thing is useless and stupid and you hate it. You feel some interest in coming on. Yes, it's oh man, uh, oh man, this is going to be a big one. It's going to boil down to this. Is it even worth living in a world where things don't always go your way? Or to put uh, put it differently, being alive is good, but maybe being dead is good. Or to put it a third more copulatastic way, to be or not to be. Man, this is uh, this is a big one, Hamlet. This is the big speech of the book named after I guess eh, is named after I guess you eh, I guess you better go eh, talk it out huh choose wisely you can, eh, clear your throat and raise one hand in front of you you can either be or not be or not to be and I'm gonna go to page 16 so I can be this is what you say to nobody in particular. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it's as noble or in the mind as not for the swings and errors of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing them, and then to die to sleep no more, and by, and by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks the flesh is heir to. Uh, Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die to sleep, uh, to, uh, to sleep perchance to dream either is the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled out this mortal coil must give us pause. Man, nicely done, Hamlet. Okay, and then Ophelia is here. See, page 48. <laughs> You say hi to Ophelia, but she's acting all upset, trying to give you uh, back the presents and all the love letters you've ever sent her of your relationship. Weird. It looks 
Ah, it looks like someone's convinced her that you're not taking eh, that you're not marriage material after all. To be fair, you did just finish talking uh, out loud about killing yourself, huh? And I thought, eh, and though I know you're frantically eh, frantically looking for the whatever man, she's just doing this because chicks be crazy option. Hamlet, you're not doing. Hey, eh, you're nothing if not classy. I'm not going to give it to you. Listen, I'm going to help you out. You think Ophelia is crazy, but maybe maybe she's just acting crazy. And considering that possibility, you have to get at, you, have to, eh, you think to yourself that Ophelia doesn't have any real reason as being upset as eh, as she appears to be. Sure, you've kind of ignored her for a few weeks, which is selfish and tricky. But on the other hand, this isn't the first time you've been caught up in something and you're sure she can handle it as she has before with understanding and not by, you know, abandoning the relationship entirely in some stupid castle room. So maybe it is entirely possible that she's being fake crazy too. Maybe maybe because she's figured out uh, figured things out and also wants to murder Claudius, you decided you need to wait you need a way to see if she's faking crazy while you're simultaneously also faking crazy without revealing to anyone that you uh, who may or may not be listening that you're both actually just faking the crazy and is there a good phrase or something you can use? Say I never loved you Hamlet is an idiot. We've gone over this before. Okay. Uh, what? She says furious. I don't think this was the secret words, bro. Um, you try it again. So you say, get thee to a nunnery. Yes. 90. Okay. You tell her to get to a nunnery because if she has sex, her kids will be awful because everyone is awful. A man, if you had, if you only had the time, you'd be the awfulest person any, uh, ever. Also, if a fool could, uh, would marry, uh, also only a fool would marry her because anyone smart knows that women are awful. What do you say? Uh, why are we saying these horrible, horribly sexist things? She says. Well, uh, I gotta say, is that it's a pretty good question. Last chance, Hamlet. Say, uh, women, sir, uh, women are idiots who just wanted sexing. It's three thirty-three. Sometimes I wonder why I give you these choices. Okay, so you say those things, but at least you clarify that you think women just pretend to be dumb to get that sex they so crave. You accuse all women of being unfaithful, and there should be no more marriages because they necessarily involve women, and women are awful. There's a couple things wrong with that, actually. Anyways, you uh, you say that people who are already married can say uh, can stay married. You guess, except for one very special couple in particular. You look at her to see if she's getting what you're hinting at, and she looks super angry, actually. I don't think you're going to pull this off, dude. This whole conversation is an unmitigated fiasco, and she... And, and if she was just pretending to be mad before, she's seriously furious now. Congratulations, Hamlet. You just broke up with your girlfriend because you were pretending to be insane and trying to mm, talk in a super secret code. You can't ha really say you blame her for leaving. All you have now, uh, all you have now, is your plan to trap Claudius with the Choose Your Own Adventure books. So you go home, rest, and tomorrow that's exactly what you do. Uh, so page two hundred six. Uh, this way. Okay. <coughs> Uh, first thing in the morning, you go. Out, uh, you show up to the royal court. You look out in the assembled uh, courtiers and see that everyone's here. Your mom da and stepdad, Polonius, Rosicrans, and Guildenstern, and a bunch of people you've never met, Ophelia, the whole gang. You're still looking around when Horatio comes up behind you and slaps you on the back in an, ex in an expertly executed maneuver. Pro times, he says. How's it going, bro times? Good, you say. Listen, can you do me a favor? You explain that you're going to be watching Claudius closely, but I ask if you, maybe you can keep an eye on him. Too, as he reads, you're I'm um, really good at stuff. You say, wishing that there was somehow a better way to put that. He agrees that he's pretty great at stuff and consents to do something, uh, some of that watching stuff for you. All right, there's nothing left to do with him, but it's go time. Hey, Claudius, you say, brandishing your signed copy of Gonzago. Why don't you read this book today? I certainly don't see why not. He says, and you pass him the book. Now that's all. Now all that's left is to decide where to sit. So you do. Uh, so do you sit as, uh, at Ophelia's seat, as, uh, feet asking her to lay in her lap in a sexy sense, or remind her that she has genitals, or do you stand behind the king so you can see what choices he, he makes as he reads and thereby figure out if, it's, if he's going to do or not? And now I'm going to execute a glitch in the book in that it's a book and I can read it in any order I want. So I'm going to move to the next page as you do in a regular book and go. Oh crap! You forgot to tell Ophelia about her dad. Uh, well, I can't get off this party boat now, so I just skipped the. Uh, Whole murder of Gonzago scene, which is good. Even if you broke up recently, she would at least console in Ophelia for her loss, especially since you were kind of involved in his accidental death. But you were running away and partying on a boat. I am calling it. You were the worst boyfriend and or ex-boyfriend ever. But you're on this boat and it, and it set sail for England, so there's not much you can do. So do you party as best as you can, given the circumstances. Page 130. We're about to enter the pirate scene. As the boat sails for England, you catch sight of the huge army sailing towards Poland. Ugh. 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 Sorry. 
is uh, there has to be an entire military corps on board. I'm serious. There's got to be uh, 20,000 people all crammed onto a single ship. The ship is too far away for you to communicate by talking or even shouting. But look, uh, but luckily you bought some. Uh, you brought some four flags, and you were fully trained in their use. And as you know, by holding up the two colored flags in different positions, you can spell out letters of the alphabet. And in response, hooks on the other ship can send messages of it, messages back uh, to you. Hey, Hamlet here. What's going on? You say in semaphore. Hey, Hamlet. We were sent by King uh, by Prince Ford and brought from Norway. He's kind of a rough equivalent of, uh, equivalent of you to come to think of it. Anyway, he's on board, and we're all going to fight over some really terrible land that sucks, comes the sign reply. Really? You signed. Yeah, it's totally sucky land, but what are you going to do? Fighters going to fight, he signals, and we're happy to do it. Okay, thanks, you reply in uh, flag talk. Well, Ford and Braun and his army are ready to fight over something entirely useless, and the Polish are willing to defend it, too. These people will fight and kill over nothing, and you can't even kill your uncle even though you have totally valid reasons. Whoa, dude, hold up. You start to feel inspired. So, do you insp uh Okay, I'm going to take the second option because it sounds radder. So, you ins uh, so be inspired in rhyming couplets, and every couplet has the same rhyme, because that's cool. And I don't think it affects anything, so I'm going to take it once I can find the page. 193... Okay. Gas grows in Krantz and Gildan start to drop a beat and they oblige. You hold out your two hands in front of you and start throwing up signs. This is, uh, this is the signs you lay down to them. My name is Hamlet, you. You better get to check this composition. Just peeped on an awesome army boat that of its own volition is led by my man Fortinbras, a man of great ambition who, lays, uh, who lessens me whenever we're seen in just, uh, juxtaposition and, win, and who's taken in, for himself this chosen military mission but also likes my frankly a particular condition of being told to just to, uh, uh, just to, to kill by ghostly apparition and by being told to kill a man by his own, admi by his own admission has sent my dear and uh, departed regal dad to the mortician now for uh, goes uh, goes off to war and off to requisition land so sad and barren that any a given tech to, that any given tactician would think him crazy well you see this new uh, proposition suggested me Quite clearly, my apparent position this uh, to this revenge your dad and kill your new dad exp expedition when I have motives valid beyond any inquisition is weak and dumb, so I've got to end this predi predisposition toward inaction that I have. My stupid inhibition must be gotten over fast. I got to uh, reposition, or reposition myself to kill my new dad right away, and in addition, I thought to, I know this carries no small risk of repetition, and saying this out loud will only add to your suspicion. From now, the only things that I will bring to fruition are the bloody, uh, are the bloody gory parts of my own person cognition, that is to say, only thoughts regarding the commission of the brutal death of Claudius, no more exposition. And you're out. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern clap and complimenting you on your foe. They suggest the lyrics might ha, ha, make people think that you want to kill the king. Isn't that crazy? They say, ha ha ha. Oh man, that reminds me. You forgot to rhyme it with sedition. You're meant because it, totally, uh, it would have worked really well. So you keep going on the party boat. I really hope this choice doesn't change things. Uh... Party on a bird is... No, wait, shoot. Yeah, I think this does change things. I'm gonna... Crap. Uh, I'm gonna go with it. And, no, let's see. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna... No, I'm not gonna pause this. That would be against the lake stuff. Let's go to 280. No, 135. Because I'm pretty sure either way I get interrupted by pirates soon, so. Uh, well, it's too late because I already forgot the earlier page. So, uh, you open the letter, which is page 135, er, so, partying on a boat is great, but it doesn't last forever. After several hours, the party winds down from the first night. You and Rose and Krentz and Gildan start and stumble off to your quarters, three awesome dudes in one awesome room, one party, uh, one awesome party room. The next day, you wake up, still feeling the effects of the previous night's partying. You put on the shirt, but it feels different. Turns out it's Rose and Krentz's shirt. Well, as you pull it off, the letter falls out of the pocket. Rose and Krentz wakes up, teases you for wearing his clothes, and then notices the letter. Hey, Hamlet, you dropped something, he says. No, man, it's your letter. This is your shirt. You pass him the garnet. He, he has the shirt. <laughs> It's not my letter, sir. Uh, bro. He says, pulling it over the head, uh, over his head. Someone must have flipped, uh, slipped it to me sometime yesterday. What's it say? Flipping it over, you notice it's got a royal C on the back. Back. It's from King Claudius. You say, "Rosa Crimson and Golden Stern say the following." What? Okay, page one thirty-five is opening letter. I'm gonna open it. You say this is what you read. Uh, this is what you read. Dear King of England, it's me, Claudius, the King of Denmark. Listen, we get along pretty well, right? And both car uh, and both our countries are in pretty good shape. Anyway, it would be really convenient for me, and it would help both our countries stay in good shape if you could kill Hamlet for me real quick. It, uh, quick, it's not that big a deal. Just kill him, okay? Cool. P.S. I'm 100% serious. Please kill him right now. 
Uh, you and Rosencrantz and Guildenstern stared at each other for a long moment. Look at this whole time Ed, while you were planning to kill Claudius. He was also planning to kill you. Dude, you're scoping this letter's choice assassinated in orders, says Rosencrantz. I told you, man. I told you about Claudius, Guildenstern says. Or yells. <laughs> Maybe he he heard my raps from last night, you say, eh, you ask. Figure out a plan with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, page 41. Okay, you and your bros come up with a plan. It goes as follows. You replace the letter with a forgery you write together that reads, Hey king, er, hey king, you make it so that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are given fancy houses and made princes and given all cool things that it's possible to have, as they are extremely awesome, but please do not mention this letter or its constants ever again to be Claudius, the man who is writing this letter right now. If you do see me and this letter comes up and then, and then I claim I didn't ask for these things, then I'm lying. I like to pretend sometimes that I didn't write letters, but it's just pretend, huh? I can never take this back. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are awesome. Hamlet's right too. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are way awesome, though. You, re eh, you replace the officials here with a forgery. Since you're wearing a ring and it fails to royal seal, this is surprisingly easy. You, de uh, you decide that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern will deliver the letter while you catch the next boat back to Denmark to kill Claudius. At the, uh, you're at this stage of fulfilling the plan when pirates attack. Okay, pirates, good. We're back on course. We're back on the course. This is good. I think we saved some time. Uh, thank you, thank you. You're too kind. Uh, let me set the scene. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern rush above death, uh, decks to the sound of the lookout yelling, Pirates ho! Following his arm importing the rise and you see a ship. Uh, uh, sailing directly towards you with an alarming speed, her disguise of a Danish, um, Danish flag being lowered into a as black flag with a grinning skull and crossbones that fills in its place. It's pretty badass. Behind her, a huge storm is gathered, lightning strike into the water. Both are headed straight for you. She's a magnificent ship, um, magnificent ship for uh, three massive beauty, running 50 meters long from boat astern, or bat astern. She slices uh, cleanly through the sea with the wind spilling her sails. Fourteen, uh, four, uh, 1,400 tons of boat, a symphony of wood, uh, cloth, brass, and all, cloth, brass, and iron. She's as tall as she is long with each of her masts proudly carrying four gargantuan rectangular sails. We're getting a, back, uh, a baffling complexity stretches in between each mast, its crossbars in the side of her hull. She carries 26 caterns, uh, cannons on her port side and 26 on her starboard, each loaded in at the ready, and... <laughs> And she's running with her gun points open. She also sails with two forward-facing cannons mounted on her bow, on her bow, but beneath which protrudes the beautifully carved figure of a mermaid. Over fifty, uh, over one hundred fifty strong and able men, all pirates call her home. The, uh, the painted and polished red wooden letters affixed to her hull portray her name, Calypso's Gale. You, on the other hand, are on a party boat, the HDMS uh, Vesselmania IV. Uh, your boat is a mere one hundred tons. Her armaments are a slight six cannons per side. Vesselmania is two smaller mass bear, a single triangular sail each. Her crew of twenty is inexperienced and young. Her captain, with whom you've ha only had a passing acquaintance, seems fresh out of captain school, if that is even a thing. He's there at your side now, barking orders left and right. Man, haul up the sails and run below decks to prepare the cannons. It is a scene of barely controlled chaos, and that's when you hear the first report of cannon fire. Both shots hit their target. The pirates are firing a can uh, chain shot. Two, cannibals, uh, two cannonballs tied together with the length of heavy chains, stuffed into a single cannon, designed to tear apart sails and rigging as they blast through it. The first shot tears apart some of the rigging on your forward sail, but, uh, but luckily nothing critical is damaged. The second shot hits low, and instead of tearing at the sails, it decapitates the captain in an instant. His headless bloody body drops at your feet. Oh, pirates, this is so awesome! Page 632. <coughs> Running out of water. Uh, yes, well, the bad news is that they're not messing around. Risen Crimson and Gildenstern take one look at the bloody corpse of the captain lying at your feet and rush below decks, tripping over each other on their way to, uh, down the ladder. The first mate is staring at the captain's body in shock. In shock. A, few, a huge burst of lightning flashes across the darkening sky and rain begins to fall on Vesselmania's desk, uh, deck. Calypso's gale is gaining on you, and her forward cannons are being reloaded. The distance between the two ships is decreasing by the second. What do you do? Uh, you take command of the vessel, page 572. Oh, jeez. I'm assuming command of this vessel, you say, taking the hat off the captain's head and putting it on your own. The, cr and the crew acquiesces easily. You're the oldest person on board, and you are also royalty. Lucky for you. Report your order. Mate sail is on damage. A giant rigging is on the secondary sail has been destroyed by cannon shot, but repair uh, crews have been dispatched, replies your first mate. Hull integrity is 92%. We're sailing in a broad reach. Uh, you are calling enough sailor talk to know the means it, it, the wind is at your back, but you're sailing at a slight angle to it. It's the safest way to travel. It's ra traveling with the wind exactly at your back makes for a faster but less stable boat. You normally want to minimize your chances of losing control. On the other hand, with pirates at your tail, maybe now is the best time to worry about safety. What are your orders, Shuts first mate? Uh, you, uh, uh, you turn to page 306 by uh, changing course so that the wind is directly at our back. Pull, 
I put the window to bracket you order. Your first mate says, aye, sir, and begins barking at commands to the crew. Set sails leeward. We'll, uh, we're running, uh, we'll be running before the wind, boys. The crew adjusts the sail quickly, and you can feel it as the boat begins to uh, gain speed. You look behind you, expecting to see Calypso's gale fail, uh, fading from view, but even the, with the wind fully at your back, this pirate ship is still gaining. It wasn't enough. Calypso's gale fires again, and the chilling shot tears through Vesselmania's stern next to the port side of the hull, thankfully above the waterline. Order's caption, you stare, uh, you stare at Calypso's gale through his spyglass. The square shape of a rigging mass reminds you of something, so you try to remember everything you know about sailing before you do anything. Page 40. What time are we at? We are at 40 minutes now. Uh, or 39 minutes. These uh, these sails she's carrying. Thir uh, three mats, each with four rectangular sails on them. Of course, you say. The pirate captain did what you have done this in this position. He's ch chosen the most favorable uh, favorable angle of attack. He's coming with the wind fully at his back because that's, what it, uh, because that's when his boat is sat. Uh, Fastest. Those square rigged sails are terrific at uh, catching the wind, and he's got lots of them, but their disadvantage is that they can't be adjusted quickly. Every change requires the crew to climb up and change the rigging on each sail individually. You, on the other hand, can adjust your two triangular, uh, triangular sails quickly, and it can be done at the deck level. If you come out into the storm while maintaining a slight angle away from it, you should be able to turn around, maintain speed, slip past Calypso's gale, and be long gone before she can even begin to turn. It's your only hope. You lower the a glass, lock eyes with your first mate, and shout your orders to the captain over the roar of the storm. Uh, so, uh, uh, coming to the storm, set sails, windward, keep it close, called tack, that is page 63. That's this way. The sails are adjusted by your crew. As you turn towards the wind, the waves which had been previously traveling with you are now moving against you. Huge white capped waves crest and sp uh, splash over the deck. Hold on, man, you shout into the gale. Your ship heels over, almost capsizing with the intensity of the turn, but your sails keep just clear of the water, and the maneuver is successful. As she writes herself, you see Calypso's gale ahead of you, bearing down still at speed. All you need to do is pass by her side, and you'll be free. Steady, steady, you shout as the two ships approach each other. Vesselmania is slipping by on the, on the right. Looking at the, uh, looking at the crew of the pirate ship, you can see them scrambling out to the rigging, adjusting the sails as fast as they can. It, it, it shouldn't be enough. It shouldn't be. But they're not trying to come about. They're not trying to uh, slide up parallel to fire the cannons. Instead, they've heard, uh, thrown the rudder hard to port, sending the ship into a tight curve. They're attempting to ram you, Hamlet. Hard to starboard. Hard to starboard, you scream. Ugh. But there's not much time. Yeah, but there's not enough time. Calypso's gale te uh, tears into the side of your ship at full speed. You and the rest of the crew are knocked back, uh, are knocked to the deck as vessel mania is cleaved almost in two. You scramble to your feet and see that she somehow managed to stay, uh, stay together, impaled by the much larger bow, uh, bow of Calypso's gale. But she's mortally wounded. She's filling with water as you speak, Hamlet. Looking up through the storm, you see the ropes being thrown down over the edge of the pirate ship. Pirates are sliding down on the swords of the right, hoping to kill you and take whatever valuables you can before WrestleMania finally capsizes. Given her current condition, they better be fast. You better f uh, be fast, too, whatever it is you decide to do next. So you uh, ordered the crew to abandon ship, then, com and then commandeer the pirate vessel. Uh, that's page 52. <laughs> Abandon ship! All hands abandon ship! You yell into the storm. The crew looks at you in shock, but there's not much else they can do. You want us to jump into the ocean? Someone yells. I don't want you to jump into the ocean, you reply. You bite down the blade of your sword and begin to climb the ropes leading up to the pirate ship. Some of your men nearby realize what you're doing, and they're enjoying and climbing up other ropes. Part of the way up, you turn around, grasp your sword, and chat down to your remaining crew. I want you to jump into the fight! Your, uh, your crew shouts in defiance of the pirates, uh, charges the ropes, and begins to climb. Uh, you continue climbing, which is page 59. I'm out of water. Uh you and her crew scramble up the ropes part way up an explosion rocks vessel mania 4 you hold tight to the rope as the force of explosion reaches you debris, uh, shooting debris upwards into the sky taking your captain's hat with it and messing up your hair looking downward you see the entire top deck of vessel mania has been destroyed revealing fires raging underneath there's no anyone who could have survived you hope rosencrans and gildens are maybe above the decks in time but there's too much storm for you to make out the others on the ropes below you qu uh, clearly maybe maybe they were made it the ropes uh no man they died page 136 Sorry, guys. Sweet bro and hella Jeff are dead. Uh, ha. Nice try. Your friends have... Uh, have have to choose their own adventure here. You don't get to make. Uh, you get. Uh, you don't get to make life or death choices for them. If you want to do that, you should play my other book, God the Adventure. Decide how each of billions of individual stories end. Fun at first, tedious soon after. So many lives are depressingly similar. Personally, though, I hope Rosencrantz and Guildenstern sort of survive. And I think that probably counts or something. Something. Um, uh, some, uh, suddenly, lightning strikes the water below. A huge roar of thunder deafens you. But in that brief instant, the, wor uh, the world is illuminated. You see your young crew of almost twenty, both by count and by age. Cutlasses at the ready. Fighting as they climb, pirates swarm down the lines, battering the, and battling them for sport. Above them, on deck, they're being sheared by a row of pirates. And 
And at the very bow of the ship, looking down in the spy, uh, with a spyglass, stands the captain. He's got a fancy hat and a parrot on his shoulder, the works, and he's staring down at you through the storm. The darkness of the storm is restored moments later. You grimly resume your climb, one way or another, you're going to end this. So you continue climbing, attack pirates, uh, page 127. That's close by. You're about halfway up when you meet your first pirate. You decide you had the, uh, you decide you have the advantage. You can always slide down the rope to gain distance while you can only climb up, which takes more time. But before it comes to that, however, you brace your legs against the hull of Calypso's gale. As the pirate approached it to you, you push off with all your strength, sending you both into the darkness, hanging in space out above the ocean. You were ready for this, the pirate wasn't. You wield a sword and stab upward, sending it cleanly through the surprise pirate's butt. Haha, <laughs> sweet. Uh, you... Uh, you hear him scream as he falls, and then you hear a small splash as he hits the ocean. Looking up, you see another pirate already climbing down to take his place. This tri uh, the same trick isn't going to work twice, I but... So you lure the pirate to slide down lower, which is page 72. Uh, hey, you yell, big bad pirate, why don't you come down here and fight me? The pirate seems reluctant until you tell him that, uh, that he's a disappointment to his family and how the grief and shame of having a child who grew up to, be, uh, to work as a pirate, who became a pirate, seems so colossal to your parents, and yet at the same time also so private and personal that they rarely speak of him even to each other. They live with this invisible wall between them, always preventing them from being as close as they used to be, as they want to be again. The subject of their son somehow was in, a, in mind, but never approached. His parents, who used to tell each other everything, now go to bed in silence. And this pirate's actions, his choices, have created this thing, un, you know, untouchable, unreal, that nevertheless heartlessly and, ex, and, and inexorably drives his parents a little more into solitude each day. They become strangers to each other. The pirate hollers and rages and you... Uh, your waist like dis and begins climbing down. When he's close, you brace your legs against the hull and push, but the pirate is ready for it and holds on tight. What he's not ready for is the fact that you push at an angle, sending you out into space and then back into the ship further to the left of where you have been. You grab another load, uh, rope and in the same smooth action, reach up and send your rope, uh, your sword through the, the, his rope just above where he's holding. You watch as, uh, you watch as man and rope fall silhouetted by the burning deck of Vesselmania 4. They disappear into the flames. You're fired, you say. Oh, uh, you manage to climb up a bit, uh, a bit before another pirate takes his place. I hope for your sake you've got another trip up your sleeve. So you push out from the si uh, ship, use your legs as a battering ram, and smash your way inside through a port on page 146. Uh, that's a really good idea. Huh, nicely done. You push out from the uh, you push out from the ships, uh, ship, use your legs as a battering ram, and smash your way in, uh, through the porthole. You manage somehow to hit the deck, roll, and leap to your feet in one impressively smooth, mo uh, smooth motion. Unfortunately, there's no one around to see it, as everyone is above deck and engaged in battle. And you've landed in the captain's quarters. Yes, uh, around you are the uh, accoutrements of command, the ship's log, and yes, a sword. A much nicer sword, actually, than the one you started this journey with. You decide to take it. You are now w w wielding the fancy sword. You don't care that you lost your other sword. It sucks. Uh, other sword. It sucks now. Uh, you kick down the door. It has a handle, but things uh, but things were just going that way. Uh, okay, and take the ladder to the top deck. You were uh, you push open the trap door and climb uh, and climb out. In front of you is an epic battle. Is an epic battle. Your crew taking on two, sometimes three pirates at a time. It's amazing. Each success seems to fuel them uh, fuel them farther. Each pirate body hitting the deck only added adding to their experience points. You can almost see them leveling up as you watch, and it's like all their perks are being invested in battle techniques. Suddenly, you feel a cold tap on your shoulder. Turning around, you find yourself face to face with the pirate captain. You both raise your swords, uh, swords as you leap into your dueling stances. A pause, and then you rush each other, swords clashing. You thrust and parry uh, uh, back and forth until a moment comes when your swords catch each other, and in that sudden silence, you stare across your blade and into each other's eyes. You fight like a dairy farmer, he says. How appropriate. You fight like a ow, you say, as he slices your arm cutting. You, this was, it was superficial this time. You're lucky, dude. The pirate gloats at drawing first blood, pointing to you and calling you a bunch of very unkind names that I'm not going to say here because I don't want you to throw down this book so you can try and find out and murder this pirate in real life. Just take my word for it. The things he said about you are that bad. On the plus side, while he gloats, there's no thing. You should attack his hand while he's pointing at you. Uh, oh, shoot. Page 67. Uh... You drop to one knee and put all your effort into sending your sword upward at his outstretched hand. You, man you manage to cleave it from his wrist at a single slice. The momentum from his blow carries his, uh, carries his hand up into the air, and you both watch he's in shock and you in surprise at how good this awesome sword is, as uh, as his detached hand describes uh, describes an arc directly towards you. It hits your chest with a bloody splat. You brush his hand off in your jacket and say, uh, Hey, I never knew... Hey, I never knew what it was like to cut off a limb before. I guess I'll finally get some first-hand experience... Uh...
So bad and so good. The pirate captain screams in rage, charging you with a sword. You deftly parry and sidestep the ending up behind him. The two of you circle each other, flurries of sword play erupting wherever uh, wherever one of you det detects an opportunity. Despite this injury, not, uh, despite his injury, neither of you is able to gain the advantage on the rain soaked deck of the ship. Suddenly, lightning strikes the, uh, the brass rail behind the pirate captain. He is briefly stunned by the tremendous thunder that follows. He briefly stunned well, but being a few feet away, you recover more quickly. There's your opportunity, so you attacked it. You attacked his dominant sword, uh, sword bearing arm, which is page 65. Uh, you swing your sword sideways as hard as you can, making contact with his left elbow at full speed. Your sword slices through the, f uh, the flesh easily. He screams and tries to attack you with his other arm. But a second later, you cut that one off at the elbow, too. You look down at the now useless arms lying on the ground, er, lying on the deck, one hand still clutching the sword. The perfect thing to do, uh, to, you know, the perfect thing to deadpan suddenly comes to mind. The words crystallizing in your head like they were written for you by the very uh, gods themselves. All hands on deck. Okay, that one's pretty rad. Page 506. The pirate screams at you, livid. He's lost some very important body parts, but he's not going to stop. He's out of control with rage and will fight to the very end. <coughs> <coughs> He's out of control with rage and will fight you to, uh, to the end. You can't let your guard down. He'll take you apart with his teeth if you let him. It's time to finish this, Hamlet. So you deliver the killing blow, page 224. Okay. The captain tries to spit on your face. You stab him right in the chest, piercing along. He gasps and swears at you. Save your breath, you say. You, step, you take a step back and slice off, the, uh, slice off the captain's chin, sending it flying into the rigging. Come on, keep your chin up, you yell, slicing again at his face. You cut off the tip of his nose and it flies overboard. You know what they say, you say, grim uh, grimly taking your sword in both hands. Follow your nose. With one huge strike, you behead the pirate captain. His head rolls at your feet. You kick it over to board in the ocean. Let me just say, holy crap! Never in your life have you fought so uh, well. This was awesome, literally awesome. If you lived to be a thousand years old, you could, uh, you'd never have a fight go so amazingly well as it did today. Uh, you're, uh, you're catching your breath when you hear familiar voices yell, Hamlet. Turning around, you see Rosencrantz and Guildenstern rushing toward you. They survived. In fact, they did more than survive the battle. Like you, they thrived in it. All around them lie the bodies of pirates, like your, uh, and your crew dispatches the last few survivors. This is incredible. Co uh, Eclipse's gale is yours. And the storm surrounding her is clearing as quickly as it appeared in the first place. Some pierces through the clouds. You and Rosencrantz and Guildenstern hug each other, and, you crew, uh, and your crew cheers. Pulling back, uh, Guildenstern notices the blood on your jacket and, your, and the headless horse on the floor. What happened to the captain? asked Guildenstern. Don't know, you say. Last I, uh, last I saw, he was headed for sea. Oh, Rosencrantz, does that mean that you cut his head off and then threw it overboard? What's to say when he fought it, he got a little over his head? Oh, you cut, us, uh, oh, you cut off his head and threw it overboard, you said Rosencrantz. So you take command of this larger, much nicer vessel. 324... Uh, okay, you do that and make Rosencrantz and Guildenstern your first officers. Cor uh, congratulations, Captain Hamlet. Calypso's gale is, uh, Calypso is your to command. Uh, the crew demands a speech, cheering and hollering at you, stepping onto the highest part of Calypso's bridge. You decide to give them what they want. You hold your hands out in front of you and ask for silence. They quiet, and in the moment before your speech, the only noise you hear is the sound of waves gently splash, uh, splashing on the hull beneath you. A peaceful, bo a beautiful sound. It's a beautiful moment. You look at your crew, and they and they at you. you people off as... <coughs> 50 minutes in and my voice is dying uh, we're getting pretty close to the end though uh, people often speak of the machinery of fate uh, the machinery of fate you say as though the course of the, our lives is governed by some untouchable unknowable clockwork well if fate be a machine today she was a machine that was transformed us all into an unstoppable force of vengeance your crew cheers wildly gods even your true crews uh, your crew cheers even louder yes you say today we uh, truly we were gods from the machine uh, your crew resumes, uh, resumes their duty. Th uh, this was a really an amazing part of your adventure, Hamlet. You're sure that should you ever one day write a book about the story or perhaps even a stage production, you'd definitely include this scene. Why, you'd have to be literally crazy to write a story where you join into England, get attacked by pirates, actual pirates, and then just sum up the whole adventure in a single sentence. Ha, huh, that'd be the worst, but who puts a pirate attack scene in their story and doesn't show it to the audience? Hopefully nobody, that's who. Even from a pure, uh, purely structural viewpoint, you've got to give the audience something awesome to make up for all the introspection they've been doing. That just seems pretty obvious, is all. Anyway, enough crazy hypotheticals. Where are you off to sail? So back to Denmark, uh, 227. We are almost there. Well, sailing to Denmark, you and Rosencrantz and Guildenstern come up with a plan. Clearly, King Claudius wants you dead, but he isn't willing to move overtly. Hence, the letter he plans to... to uh, 
planted on your friends. Heck, even the pirate attack could have been orchestrated by him. It's impossible to know what, uh, who he's gotten to while you've been gone. You can't trust anyone. You decide to attack Claudius more discreetly, lest a frontal attack from a pirate ship disturb the people of Denmark and weaken your right, uh, we can, your right to rule. That's page 70. Rather than sailing to, into shore and attacking the king head, head on, you decide not to tape your hand. This is the plan you come up with. You'll approach Denmark at night, flying Danish flags. Clips his deal, the gale will stay out from shore, uh, looking like any other trader, but will remain ready to move on your signal. You'll, uh, you'll leave Rosencrantz and Guildenstern in command, drive over, dive overboard into the ocean, and swim to shore. Once there, you'll compose and send three direct letters to Horatio by message, uh, by messenger. The first will be addressed to Claudius and read, Hey, I'm back from England all by myself. Surprise, you will be tomorrow when I see you. P.S. I am naked. Hopefully you'll be able to scare confuse him into some, uh, some rash overt action against you, which you'll be able to counter with Calypso's health. The second goes to your mother and reads, Hey, Mom, I'm so mad at you for marrying Claudius, and I'm, as I'm pretty sure I'm going to kill him. So try to act surprised? Uh, the third and final letter is for your friend Horatio and says, Hey, Horatio, crazy story. Pirates attacked, and then they took me hostage, but just me, and then they brought me to Denmark because I'd said I'd do them a favor. <coughs> <clears throat> uh, speaking of which, can you make sure these other two letters reach mom and uncle dad? Uh, then come see me real quick, okay? I'll be down by the docks. This should be enough to ensure that your letters are delivered and see if Claudius has gone to Horatio while you were away. If he hasn't, Horatio, um, if he hasn't, Horatio can help you take down Claudius. If, if he has, well, you'll deal with Horatio the same way you deal with and you dealt with the pirates, with your swords and your wits, both deadly sharp and both insanely pointed. Uh, <coughs> <clears throat> uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern agree to your plan. You arrive near Denmark shore in the middle of the night. The waves slip, the waves silver with reflected moonlight. Good luck, my friends. You tell Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, and to you they reply. You've both grown so much in this trip. It's been so great. You never felt closer to these awesome dudes. You dive into the sea and swim to shore. Page eighty. You deliver the letters. Uh, oh, that's your uh, You send your letters. You have time before the messenger will deliver them, so you wander down to the docks. You get attention of a passerby who looks like he works here. Excuse me, what's that ship over there? You say, pointing at, as casually as you can to the, and towards the insanely majestic ship. Her? Oh, that's uh, Calypso's Gale. Looks like a Danish slater. I, yeah, I imagine she's, and she'll be docking in a few hours, she said. Oh, neat, you say. Everything's going to plan. Uh, you wait to the ship just in case Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are walking in. You water around waiting for Horatio to show up. You eat some fried fish. It is really yummy. Suddenly you feel a tap on your shoulder. Looking around, you see your old friend Horatio from him at your back. He says, hugging you, did you deliver my letters? You ask. Yep, so what's your story? Pirates attacked and only took you hostage. Then they brought you back here for no reason. Haha, <laughs> that's so crazy. That's really what happened? Do you trust Horatio? If you do, then you'll let him in on the full story. If you don't, you'll let him think that only you made it back from the trip. Trust no one, so... Page 152... <sighs> Uh, yes, that is exactly what happens, you say. <coughs> <coughs> what about Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, he asked. They uh, died, you say. The king wanted to murder me, and he got them to carry a letter for, uh, telling the English king to tell me. Yeah, that's it. And so I secretly placed that note with a forgery that told them to kill Rosencrantz and Guildenstern instead. They're dead now, because, as I said earlier in my letter, the pirates left after they, after they captured me. Yes, everything fits pr uh, together nicely. It's a good lie. Close to the truth, so it won't be hard to keep straight. Whoa, Horatio says. Bro, that's cold. What did Rosencrantz and Guildenstern do to deserve that? Um, yes, that is a reasonable question, and the reasonable answer is that they uh, carried the letter from Claudius on purpose? That they were allied with him all along, and I trust them as much as I trust snakes? Oh, uh-huh, says Horatio. Oh, and I would totally kill anyone who was secretly working for my stepdad, you say, making significant eye contact with him. Huh, says Horatio, perfectly neutrally. Darn these even-handed, non-committal responses that tell you nothing. You, uh, you've been walking as you talk, and now you and Horatio find yourselves in the graveyard. It's close to the river everyone takes the drinking water from, which kind of, yeah, which I guess kind of explain why people act so crazy around here. Spoiler alert, water contamination. Spoiler alert, this is gross. There are two grave diggers here. Ho wait, hold up. One of them is leaving. One off to, uh, one off to have his own adventures, no doubt. Do you ever think about that, Hamlet, about all the people you pass in the street and how they each and how they each the start of their own little narrative. How it's with the people you'll never talk to are off having their own lives, building their own stories. And isn't it crazy that from their point of view, they're uh, you're the minor character entirely forbid uh, forgettable? Well, it's true. This grave digger this story should. <laughs> Well, it's true, and in this Gravedigger story, you play the role of guy who shows up and shoots just as I leave. You too. He leaves. The remaining Gravedigger is singing. So you listen to his singing, page 142, and we are now in Act 5. Nearly there.
Okay, the gravedigger sings about his being young and in love. He's singing while he digs a grave, you say. Um, yes, it says right here. His job is to do his dig grave, so he's used to it. Whoa, you say. This whole thing is seriously blowing your mind. The gravedigger sings about being old now, and the tune is pretty catchy, actually. While he's big, uh, busy digging the grave, he digs it pre uh, into a pre-existing grave. Remember that in our time period, it's not exactly like this is especially weird or awful. And digs something up. He tosses it behind him. Hey, there's a skull here. Look, skull, page 164. Yorick's speech, here we come. Okay, uh, you keep your distance from the grave digger, but look at the skull intently. That skull had a tongue in it once, you say, Horatio. Uh, yep, says Horatio. It had jowls, too, you say. Yeah, probably, says Horatio. Maybe it was a politician's skull? Oh, or a courtier. Lord such a one, or whatever. Look, that guy's throwing it around like it's not even a thing, you say. Lord such and such, you mean, says Horatio, as a grave digger digs up another skull. There are now two skulls here. The skulls seem pretty interesting, and the other skull seems pretty interesting, too. You close your eyes and think very clearly. Look at uh, look other skull. Then you open your eyes and examine the other skull intently. I'm not going to lie, from this instance, it looks a lot like the first skull. You're fascinated by it, though. Maybe that skull was a lawyer's skull, as you say, nudging Horatio. Look at him now. Where's an impressive lawyer tricks now, huh? His fancy rhetoric for the judge and jury. He's dead, says Horatio. Why doesn't he sue this guy for assault after he dug up his skull with a, trouble, uh, with a shovel if he's such a fancy lawyer, yeah, lawyer you say? I'll have to say it's probably because he's dead, says Horatio. Maybe it was a landowner's skull instead. Maybe he... If you owned all this land, it had complicated accounting for it. Ha! Huh. Is it one of those accounting rules that his empty skull now gets filled up with dirt, you ask? Yes, I believe that's generally what happens when you die, says Horatio. You, so, you stare at him widely, wildly, then back to the skull, and then back to Horatio. Then you still stare at the skull for a bit. Listen, to, uh, listen Horatio says, maybe you want to talk to the gravedigger for a while? I'm sure he'd find your viewpoint absolutely novel and riveting. Okay, you talk to the gravedigger, page 149. A gravedigger and you chat back and forth. Here's a snippet of the conversation you have. This whose grave is this? You say it's mine. He says I thought it was yours because you're the only one lying in it. You say, uh, really, Hamlet? He's not lying in it. He's standing in it, digging it. And you're going down for a lying down, lying on truth pun that I'm. In. And if you're going for a lying down, lying on truth pun, then I'm sorry, and it's not going to work. And you're lying out of it, so it's not yours. Says the gravedigger. Uh, right. Gravedigger, super proud of his dumb wordplay. He goes on. Actually, I'm not lying. It really is mine. But you are lying, you say, before I can stop you, because you're in it, and you're saying it's yours, but you're alive, and graves aren't for the living. Aha! Got you there! Riveting. This back and forth goes uh, back and forth, and eventually it comes out that they've been uh, digging a grave for a young woman, and you, as you were an uncrewed brute, ask how long he's had this job before even uh, before you even ask his name, and he says he's been working at a uh, as a grave digger since the day Hamlet was born. Hey, that's you. What a crazy coincidence. You should probably say something. So you play dumb. Uh, it's page 143. Uh, anyways, you decide to play Don Hamlet. Who, uh, who is Hamlet? You, uh, you say, elbowing Horatio, who stands behind, uh, who stands behind you. Horatio rolls his eyes. Why the accent? Horatio says, "You didn't have it a second ago." Hamlet is the friend who went to England because he was crazy. Says the grave, uh, says the grave digger. He'll get less crazy there, or he won't. But either way, it won't matter because everyone's crazy in England. Racism, says Horatio. How did the Prince Hamlet go? How you say crazy? You ask. Very strangely, he replied. Oh, God, you uh, you two are going to go at it again, aren't you? Oh, God, you are. How strangely, you ask. By losing his mind, he said. On what grounds, you ask. Hey, stop setting him up. Why, right here, uh, why, right here in Denmark, he says. Ha, ha, ha. Listen, I'm cutting you off. The rest of your conversation is censored, but at some point he gestures to one of the skulls where you were looking... Uh, you were looking at earlier, and volunteers, that's the skull of York, once the jester of the king, now dead and buried 23 years. He poured a flag, uh, he poured a flag on a Vrenish on my head once, said the grave digger. Check this out, you're really interested in about hearing about either of those things. So 542 is talk about York. <coughs> at this point in the story, I don't want to make any deviations from the skull plot, because anything might be, uh, anything might change the ending. 542. You pick up the skull. Uh, you pick up the skull and hold it in front of you. You begin to feel inspired. Alas, poor York! You say, "I knew him, Ratio, a fellow of infinite jest, a most excellent fancy. He hath borne me on the biz back a thousand times, and now how abhorred in my imagination it is. My gorge rises at it. My gorge rises at it. Here hung those lips that I have kissed. I know not how often. Where be your gibes now? Your gambles, your songs, your flashes of merriment, where you sat on the table of roar? Not. Uh, not one now to mock your own grin, and quite chapfallen. Now get you to my lady's ch chamber and tell her, let her paint an inch and thick to this ma to this favor she must come. Make her laugh at that. What my friend means to say, says Horatio, is that he remembers York and the fun times they share, but now to look at his ghost reminds him, uh, 
as it grows for man to remind, uh, makes him want to drop the park. Ah, says the great digger. He then asks a dead life of skull where, it, you know, where its jokes and songs are, and then tells the skull to go to his girlfriend's room and tell her that no matter how much makeup she puts on, she'll end up like him one day. Horatio so, says, "Well, not exactly like him," says the grave digger, as male and female skulls have several different, uh, several structural differences. Uh, you interrupt them, Beth. Horatio, do you think Alexander the Great looked at uh, like this after he died? Yeah, prob, says Horatio. The skull is smelly, you said. Yeah, uh, yeah, prob, says Horatio. Do you think it's rude that we can be alive and be kings of the world, and then we die and return to the eighth earth, and then someone might use that earth to make mud, and then use that mud to fix a hole in a bale? Uh, a hole in a barrel. He uses mud to fix a hole. Or Horatio begins, but you interrupt him. So you can use mud. Uh, you can also use mud to batch a wall. You say. Suddenly you're startled by noises. It sounds like screaming. So you investigate the noises. Page one sixty six. You, Horatio, and the grave digger investigate the noises and discover that they were caused by Gertrude, your mom, Claudius, your, uh, your new dad, you'd sport, uh, sort of murder, Laertes, Ophelia's brother. You haven't really hung out with him but that much, uh, that much actually. A priest, priests who ordained ministers of the church, and a coffin. Coffins are what people get buried in. Dude, you should know this. It seemed like Gertrude was screaming, wailing, weird. You're, um, you elbow your friend. Hey, you say, look how sucky that coffin is. Look how small the ceremony is. It must have been someone who killed themselves. You know it would be hilarious if we stayed and watched. Listen, Hamlet, there's something you should know, Horatio says. Shh, you say, look, that was, uh, that's Laertes, you say to the grave digger. You pause and stare at him intently. Yeah, he's pretty rad, you say. Hamlet, Horatio, say. Uh, Horatio says, don't you wonder why Laertes is at a funeral? Maybe if he's there, it means that someone close to him died. You cut him off. I can't uh, I can't eavesdrop on people in their most private moments of grief if you keep trying to have a serious conversation with me about a life or death matter with me, you hiss at him. Oh, that, that's hissing. Never mind. Uh... Turning your attention back to Laertes, you see him arguing with the priest, asking for more rights. More rights, he says. But the priest says he's done all the rights he should do already, and then some. Since this person committed suicide, called it, they don't get as many rights. If we do any more rights, we'll prefer the blessed souls of the other people who uh, of the other people buried here. He says. You, Horatio, and the grave digger all wince as you glance at the skulls you dug up. Um, whoops. Uh, Laertes continues to argue with the priest. Well, fine, then go ahead and lay here, jerk of ram, a priest. Uh, uh, Laertes says, my sis will be an angel in heaven while you're burning in hell. He low, uh, they lower her body into the grave. Wow, he's really upset. Wait, sister, Ophelia is dead? Ophelia is dead? Is page 211. Okay, we're an hour, four minutes into this video. About an hour into the speed run. 211. Okay, um, Ophelia is dead, you say out loud, shocked. The grave digger shrugs. He's not friends with any of these people. I tried to tell you, Horatio says. I meant to tell you earlier, but you seem so happy to be back, and I, I, I wasn't... Look, I'm sorry, Hamlet. She passed away shortly after you left on your trip. Uh, Gertrude and Laertes and Claudius are still unaware that you're here. Gertrude throws flowers on her grave, saying that she'd always hoped Horatio, uh, Ophelia would marry you, and that instead she'd be throwing flowers on her wedding bed. Um... Uh, Jeez, uh, Gertrude, inappropriate. This is not something for a new mother-in-law to do for newlyweds. Mary uh, curses three times upon whoever it was who robbed Ophelia of her sanity, and then curses again ten times three again, ten times for a total of thirty-three curses. Then he jumps into the grave so that he might hold her in his arms once more. Jeez, Larry, it's like double inappropriate to the power of three for a total of eight inappropriates. Okay, so we're all really inappropriate. Uh, so we're all uh, so they're all really upset and acting crazy. The, uh, the right thing to do here is go home a person later and say you saw them at a funeral but you didn't want to interrupt. Also. It'll give you a chance to deal with your grief too, which you should be feeling. You are feeling it, aren't you, Hamlet? She was your sweetie, and she, you come back from a trip to find her dead of apparent suicide. What do you do? You step in the shadows and introduce yourself dramatically, because that is what Hamlet does in his life. Page two fifty. You step out of the shadows of the graveyard, leaving Horatio and the grave digger behind. Who is the man who, whose grief is so extreme, whose words of sorrow that can even make the stars themselves stand still, muttering sadness? And what did they hear? It's me, Hamlet the Dane! Then you hop into the grave, joining Laertes there. Why not? Emotions are a, complete, are a competition, right? Laertes sees you and screams in rage. The devil take thy soul, he shouts, which I mean, if you're going to yell anything, it's pretty much the office, and the most, most classiest thing to yell at a. Eh at a time and place like this. And with that, you fight. That's right, you and Laertes fight in the graveyard during a funeral in an open grave with a coffin of Ophelia at your feet. This is how you choose to live your life. Uh, uh, Laertes punches you in the teeth and you stagger back in until you collide with a grubby, uh, with the muddy grave wall, you raise your eyes up into Laertes, wiping blood from your mouth into the back of your hand. You, graze, uh, you glance at your bloody hand. That's a funny way to pray, you say, and laugh. Laertes looks at you. Here's how I do it. You, um, here's how I do it. You jump at him, forcing your head into your chest as hard as you can. He falls backward, winded, gasping for air. Our father, you say, your left hand uh, connected with his chest. Who art in heaven, here your right hand collapses, uh, collides with a 
the punishing blow with his jaw. How would be thy his arms shoot? His arms shoot out and encircle your throat before you can react. He squeezes. You see stars dance around the edge of your vision. You don't want to do that, you gasp, but Larry does only squeezes tighter. Now, why is that, Hamlet? He, he says, smirking, mock concern written on his face. You lock eyes with him. There's something dangerous inside of me, and you should be afraid of it, you say. I am. You shouldn't make me angry, Laertes. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. Laertes laughs at you, and you feel almost giddy. You can, uh, you can feel yourself losing control. You can feel yourself wanting to start it. Or starting to want it. I won't tell you again, little man. You say unsure if you're threatening her with him or pleading with him. Take your hands off, so you can hulk out or be Hamlet. I'm gonna keep being Hamlet because walking out would be the uh, cop out. Hey. Rather than embracing the madness, you bring your hands up between Laertes' hands and passing them outward, free yourself, uh, free your neck from his grasp. You're vaguely aware of your mother shouting your name as you punch Laertes over and over again, avoiding his own punches as best you can. You get hey, both getting in some pretty good hits. Finally, Horatio and the grave digger jump down at the grave and hold the two of your part. You're trying to break free. What the heck is this about, your your mother? This is a funeral and you're fighting in an open grave for no reason. Mom, Laertes said he loves Ophelia more than I did. You say I love her more than forty billion. These stupid old brothers. He really is crazy, says Claudius. I'll eat a crocodile to prove how serious. I am. I'm sorry for my crazy son, Gertrude says. Usually he calms down after a little while. You decide to prove her right. Turning to Laertes, you say, listen, bro, why are you treating me like this? I've done nothing to deserve this. Laertes stares at you, all gassed, almost like he holds you responsible for Ophelia's death. Anyway, you say, Hamlet out. You leave. After uh, A little while later, Horatio catches up with you. Hey, sorry, Claudius made me leave too. What about the grave digger, you say? I think he's back to digging graves. He was supposed to be working the whole time we were there anyways. Ah, you say. Uh, so do you talk to Horatio again, or... No. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you do. You talk to Horatio about your pirate ship adventures. <coughs> but you, you already just told him about it. If you talk to him about it again, that story is just going to be super repetitive. So you talk to him about the pirate ship again, because... Pirate ship. Okay, fine. Remembering that you haven't decided you can trust him yet, you have a long conversation where you explain again in detail the lie you told him. You elaborate it into a crazy story where you alone come, o or come across the letter by accident. You leave out all the awesome parts of the pirate battle, a crime in itself, and you tell him on uh, and you tell him only you made it back alive and how Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. And he's all, whoa, that must make you sad. And he was like, nah, bro, they got what they deserved. And he was like, whoa, bro, harsh. You decide, uh, you decide to not tell him how... <clears throat> how you have one of the most impressive ships in the world today just waiting outside of Denmark Harbor for your signal. All right, we're bound up to speed with your cover story of how you escaped again, and Horatio has made the appropriate sympathetic noises. Satisfied? <clears throat> Look, you can stop pretending. We all, uh, we all know you kind of lost the plot here and wanted to waste everyone's time while you got a refresher from me. But now you're out of options, and you, all you can do is this. Talk to Rishi about what just happened. Turn to page 276. I just realized that I did a sort of roundabout thing when I could take the non-skull option and, and save some time. Oh, well. Uh, page 276. This is all very spur of the moment. Uh, listen, I feel kind of bad about getting into the fact that with, uh, about that fight with Laertes, you say, and ruining Ophelia's funeral. Horatio volunteers that too. You know what? I'll be nice to him. He's grieving too, right? We're like two peas in a pod, only instead of peas, we're humans. Instead of being a pod, we're in a state of grief. Okay, sir, it has a story ratio. I really just hate it when people try to grieve harder than I do use because I'm pr punching your fist into your palm. That must come up a lot, you say. Anyway, meet me at the castle tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning, okay? There's something that's going down that I think you'll want to see. Okay, I will. Sweet. We'll see you. Uh, we'll see you later, you say, and then it's awkward because you're both still walking to the castle in the same direction side by side. You walk in silence for a bit until you get the idea of stopping both so uh, because the flower looks so interesting, and then Horatio will walk ahead and it won't be weird anymore, but then Horatio stops too a few paces ahead. God. It proceeds like this, the two of you walking in fits and starts, one pausing to adjust his lighting, and uh, liking through whatever, and the other deciding to wait, but only after taking a few halting steps ahead. You guys, I don't even know. You finally do get to bed, but when you, uh, you go to sleep sad, Ophelia's dead, remember? But also excited, you're going to expose Claudius tomorrow, and you'll have Calypso's gale when you uh, to back you up, right? Or remember, while you're sleeping, I sneak in and pour a potion of not grieving anymore because feelings are boring interior. That's how liquids enter the body more and most efficiently. Remember, remember this is one and this is one callback filled scene, my friend. And you wake up not feeling too emo, which is terrific because we're honestly we're heading towards the climax. And I don't want you to make. I mean, I don't want you missing out on it because you stay home feeling sad. Okay, it's tomorrow. So you greet the do new day. <clears throat> <coughs> this is it, Hamlet. This is the day you confront Claudius. You put your best confronting the king tights in your fancy is uh, confronting the king's scabbard. Don't worry, I looked it up. It's a sheath for holding a sword. Uh, 
You and Horatio are walking towards the castle when Osric shows up. Hey, I know this guy. He's a member of the royal court, and he's super uh, manipulable. Here, I'll show you. Put your hat on, you said Osric. No, thanks. It's too hot today, he says. Nah, man, it's cold. With winds from the south and a 30% chance of uh, precipitation, you say. Oh, yeah, it's cold, he says. And yet, it's also super hot and humid, you say. Oh, uh, yes, yes, it's quite hot, he says. See? See? Uh, okay, I need to apologize because I've been making fun of your choices this entire book, but when I took over here, all I did was have a really pointless conversation with a dude who isn't even a real character in the story. I'm sorry, maybe this isn't as easy as it looks, so I'm here to tell you what Osric's here, uh, here to say. The king wants you to fence with Laertes. He's gone ahead and made the bet. He thinks that in a dozen rounds, Laertes won't win more, uh, by more than three hits. Oh, and he's put six horses on the line, six swords complete with, uh, with sword accessories, and three fancy characters. He's wagering all this neat stuff. On the one hand, you're here to expose Claudius, not Laertes, and fighting Laertes isn't actually worth, uh, doesn't actually solve anything at all and is entirely unrelated to avenging your father's death. Also, he's probably super upset about, you know, his sister and father dying, and I'm not really sure about what sword fighting him will accomplish in the helping him get past his grief department. On the other hand, well, no, actually, I can't think of a good reason why you should fight this guy. Did you hear that? I, the author of the story, who has imagined this entire realm wholesale and brought it to life inside my head, cannot conceive of the Single reason why you should fight Laertes. What should you do? You should fight Laertes. Page two thirty six. Okay. Okay. Let's do this. You say. Why not? Right. It's not like you've got anything else going on. Uh, Ha ha ha, that was sarcastic. Osric leaves and then comes back immediately. King wants to know if you'll fight him now, he says. He's just in there. Oh, right, I forgot to mention, you're right outside the royal court, which is also the castle fencing room. Anyway, messenger's got a message, right? Uh, you say that's fine, and Osric says okay and leaves. Horatio turns to you. Listen, man, I don't think you should do this. I don't, th uh, I don't think you're going to win, Hamlet, he says. Sure I am, he says. Uh... Or you say, I've been practicing fencing since the start of this story. What, says Horatio, and I'm saying what, too, because there have been zero fencing scenes, like, at all? Let's take out the pirate battle, but that was more sword fighting than fencing. There's a difference here. They both require swordsmanship, and in the same way that po poetry and essay both require writing. Uh, there's quotes there. Uh, you realize that you were lying just now and start to feel uh, start to feel bad about your chances. Nivea won't win after all. I suddenly feel a sense of foreboding that would perhaps trouble a woman. Oh, jeez, Hamlet. Oh, jeez. Um... Talk instead about the nature of free will instead of mentioning my sexism because Hamlet. Okay, 310. Uh, you talk about free will. Providence controls everything, even the sparrow's death, you say. Even if something's supposed to happen now, it will. If it's supposed to happen later, then it won't happen now. All that will, uh, all that matters is that we're prepared, uh, prepared for it. Wait, says Horatio, if you subscribe to, if you subscribe to a destiny is all worldview that where things happen when they're supposed to, how does preparedness enter into it? If it's going to happen, then it'll happen whether or not you're prepared. Um, you say. I'm done talking. Stand around and wait for something to happen. I like that idea. It means that something is going to happen. Okay, 438. Uh, you stand around for a bit. Suddenly Claudius enters, and your mom too, and Laertes, and a bunch of other people you don't know. While it looks like this plot is going to advance itself whether you want it to or not. Uh, Claudius makes you and Laertes shake hands, and you apologize to Laertes. If you do it, you explain as a victim of mental illness, you should not be held uh, criminally responsible for your actions, and it's a very nice speech, except you're only faking being crazy, so it's all sort of a dick move on your part. You draw the analogy of firing, uh, of firing an arrow over your house and accidentally hitting your brother, and how in its situation it's not really your fault for injuring him. Laertes accepts your apology, and is polite enough to not, uh, not to ask why you're recklessly firing an arrow of your house in the first place. He still wants to fence you, though. What the heck? It's a pretty... It's a pretty wide hallway, and everyone's already here. Guess you're going to have to fence right in this hallway. Why not, right? Osric offers you some cool shards. They're pretty much all the same, so it doesn't really matter. Every option is page turn to 319. Uh... You and Laertes said you all in the swords and uh, uh, settle on the swords you like and face off against each other. As you're about to get in, Claudius speaks. Let, uh, let's make this a drinking game, he says. Um, you say. If you make the first hit, Claudius says, then we'll both take a drink. Okay, you say. But if Laertes hits you and you only take this, uh, and make the second hit, he says, then we'll both take a drink too. Okay, you say. Oh, and if Laertes hits you twice before you make a hit, so you only make the third hit, then we'll both take a drink. I'm not sure if I should get drunk during a fencing match, you say. I'll put a pearl in your drink. <laughs> There's nothing suspicious about that, Claudius says. Not really th uh, super thirsty either way, you say. Claudius stares at you. Can we fence now? You say. The fencing match begins. Laertes moves toward you, sort of the ready way you do. You should go for his upper body. Page 326. Uh...
Oh, it's wait, right here. Uh, you decide to attack his upper body, but hesitate. Maybe the lower, uh, lower body is better after all? You wouldn't be expecting it. You're about to change your mind and attack the lower body when you get hit on the back of the head with a piece of dirt. The audience is heckling with you with dirt. This makes you mad, which makes you, uh, you attack his upper body after all. You jab and thrust towards Laertes' upper body. He definitely parries, blocking your every attack and returning <laughs> returning them with attacks of his own, using your own momentum against you. This isn't as easy as you uh, as it was in the pirate ship. It seems like Laertes actually no, uh, really knows what he's doing. Every time it looks like you might make a hit, Claudius seems really excited and raises his glass. Wow, that is one super. Uh, that is one thirsty usurper at the throne. Finally, and not without a bit of luck, you land up glancing blow on your Laertes' left shoulder. Got you, you say. No, uh he says. Ref, you say. Am I the ref, says Isaac? I am? Oh, yeah, yeah, that was a hit. P uh, probably so. Hooray, says Claudius. Let's drink. Hamlet, come drink with me. Look, I put a foreign substance in your drink. In the middle of a fencing here, Claudius, you say. Claudius looks crestfallen. and he lowers his drink at the fencing master. Begins again. <coughs> Go for his lower body, uh, lower body this time. Uh, 347. Uh... Uh, you went for his lower body, and Laertes is unprepared for this, and you totally get a nice, uh, and you totally score a hit right away. Nice. Page, uh, page 330. Uh, got you, you say. Okay, okay, you got me, Laertes says. Your son will win, says Claudius calmly. Uh, hello, I'm not your son, you shout and reply. Just then, your mom calls you fat and lazy and offers you a napkin to rub off your sweat, because she thinks you're so fat you've already, already sweating out of your forehead from just one little fight. Whoa, where'd that come from? What the but, Mom, you say, where'd that come from? Whatever you, uh, she says, and holds up the uh, the goblet Claudius poured for you. Look, I'm ironically drinking to your good health and fortune. Don't drink that, Claudius says. I drinks what I wants, you say. Your your mom says, and she does just that, drinking what she wants. Oh, jeez, it's a poison cup. It's too late for you now, Claudius says. Uh, you pretend you didn't hear him. Take him. Three twenty. Really? You're going to pretend you didn't hear your stepdad, the one who uh, you're here to take revenge on, I remind you, when he says you just poisoned your mother? When they invented choose your, own event, uh, your path books, I'm pretty sure they were assuming you, uh, you wouldn't choose to be insane. <coughs> so I'm... Uh, so thanks for proving them wrong, uh, Wrong, I guess. Okay, you ignore him, and since this is your adventure, everyone else ignores him, too. Why not? You're, uh, you and Laertes continue your fight. At one point, Laertes says what he's doing is against his conscience, which seems like a weird thing to say in a friendly, non-fatal fight like this, but you ignore that, too. Hooray, your ears are useless. You fight back and forth, and at one point, swords clash in front of you, and there's a moment of si uh, silence as both of you try to overpower the other. This is your chance to say something, something awesome. Bring it on, you say, as grimly and badassly as possible, but somehow it comes out as I pray you pass, your, uh, pass with your best uh, violence. I'm afraid you might make a wanton of me. So, oh well. Pushing as hard as you can, you manage to force Laertes' sword aside, and, uh, but in the fighting that ensures, he manages to cut you on the arm. In rage, you break the rules of sword fighting just a little and kicks his hand, sending the, the sword flying in response. He kicks at your hand, sending the sword flying at the exact same spot. You go scramble towards the sword, uh, uh, trying to rearm yourself. Uh, you take the right sword, page 338. Uh, you grab the right sword when Laertes grabs the left. In the flurry of the swordplay that ensues, you cut Laertes on his leg, while at the same time Laertes cuts your leg. It is a perfect symmetry. Fortunately for you, the sword you grabbed had poison on its hip. Life's full of surprises, huh? And this new surprise is that Laertes is now poisoned. Very soon you're going to be responsible for an extremely public murder. But don't worry too much. Since it was Laertes' sword that was poisoned in the first place, that means you were also poisoned from that, uh, from that early cut. Hooray! Okay, to summarize real quick, you still haven't been killed with Claudius, but you have managed to poison your one-time now dead girl's, uh, girlfriend's brother, got poisoned yourself, and allow your mother to be poison too. If you're wondering about your score right now, so I don't know, negative 55,000 kilo points? Uh, Gertrude collapses for the poison you ignored earlier, and feigning ignorance, you say, how's the queen? And Claudia says she's fainted because you guys are bleeding, and she says, no, I'm poisoned for the drink, and then she dies. <coughs> We've been betrayed, you shout, and then feigning ignorance, you shout again, quick, lock the doors, let's find out who did this. Uh, later, he's a man who is dying as we speak, is thus forced to spend the last few moments alive, explaining to you very clearly, that, and with no big words, that your mother was poisoned by the king. He also explains to you that you've been poisoned too, but I've already told you that. It's too bad too, because you said it very nicely. All Hamlet, thou art slain, no medicine in the world can do thee good. Well, I was all like, whoopie, whoopie, whoop, jokes, jokes, jokes. No, can, uh, no, I am paraphrasing. Anyway. Now is your absolute last chance. You have a poison sword in your hand, and Claudius is sitting right, uh, sitting in front of you. We'll be dead in one turn. What do you do? Last chance, Hamlet. You kill Claudius. Page five fourteen. Okay. Oh yes, finally. Yes, finally, you were killing Claudius. Oh my God, finally. Oh my God. Okay, let's do this. You stab Claudius a few times with a poison sword, but man, poison is slow, and you've already got into your system. So then you pick up the poison goblet and force it down his throat, all while calling him an incestuous, murderous, goddamn Dane. Wow. I mean, it's a little racist, at least partially self-racist too. So irony, but so wow, it's a huge dose of poison, and he dies instantly. What's that? You didn't know poison worked that way? Well, that's weird because I'm pretty sure it just did. Meanwhile, as the poison starts to kill you, Lady uh, Laertes forgives you for the deaths you caused and asks you to forgive him for the same. You do it. It's actually pretty. 
your class, you have the new call with Horatio over. Horatio, don't be crazy and check the poison too. It, you know, it's your job to tell him everyone my story uh, it's your job to tell everyone my story so people will know what really happened you need to solve the people okay says ratio glancing at the surrounding crowd which has already seen this all go down oh and write it down when you do so so future generations will know okay says ratio ooh make it one of your, those choose your own adventure dealers you say I love those right says Horatio suddenly you hear an army marching in Osric uh, uh, runs in and says uh, Fortinbras in here and is marching on the capital with some English ambassadors remember Fortinbras he's that Norm uh, Weijing crown prince whose father died and who decided right away to take action he's almost like a parallel to you only you know better Anyway, you're not going to survive long enough to talk to him. You're not actually going to survive long at all. It's it. It's time, Hamlet, to choose your last words to Horatio. Uh, uh, well, last words ever, really. Oh, I die, Horatio. The potent poison quite or uh, uh, my spirit. I cannot live this uh, to hear this news from England, but I profit. Uh, but I do prophesy the election lights on Fortinbras. He is my dying voice. So tell him with the uh, with the occurrence, more or less, which is uh, which is solicited. The rest is silence. Oh, 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 oh. Page three seventy one. Oh man, we're almost there. <laughs> Nicely said, Hamlet. I've got to give you a few points for that. So your score, uh, so your final score is okay. Let's say it's 675 points out of a thousand. It's a solid C plus. You took a heck of a lot of, uh, you took a heck of a long time to kill Claudius, but you did do the pirate side quest, which is nice because it was my, which was my mistake to put it so late in the story. Anyways, we'll open with in the remastered edition. Okay, thanks for playing. Good night, sweet prince, and thoughts of angels th uh, sing thee to thy rest. Page two eighty seven. Okay, page two eighty seven. Come on, and time. The end. Woo! Yes. Okay. Let's just talk about what happened. <coughs> Alright, I made a few pretty big mistakes in the speedrun. Uh, especially in the graveyard scene, there were a few things where I could have skipped and uh, by choosing non-skull options then gotten back to the main storyline. Uh, yeah, that was... Yeah, that was good. Uh, to, to be or not to be by uh, Ryan North, William Shakespeare, and you. Other big mistake. I only got one big glass of water. Should have gotten two, maybe three. Would have helped a lot. There was still a little bit left. Didn't see that when I took my last drink. Uh, let's see. So. Ways this run of uh, ways this one uh, run could have improved. Uh, let's see. There's the uh, whole uh, like the definition of a speed run for a choose your own adventure book is kind of nebulous because nobody's tried it before. I think I may be the first. So basically. Woo! The graveyard scene. I probably should check out the options of the uh, pirate ship battle more, see if there's a more efficient way of doing that. Like, if there's a way to get the kill blow early, that would be a pretty big find for me. Basically, ways of getting off the story and then back on quicker than usual. Also, not knowing what would happen when I chose the rhyming option did hurt my case a little bit because I had to stop for a good 20 or 30 seconds and figure out whether that was actually working. So total time around 1 minute 20 seconds, or no, 1 hour 20 minutes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Good run. Probably world record, seeing as when I looked this up, nobody had ever done anything like it before. Huh? Well, Yep, that is. That's the thing I have done now. Thanks to Ryan, uh, or shout out to Ryan North. He wrote an amazing book. Also, shout out to like everybody who helped make this glorious piece of fiction. I kind of want to do a shout out to William Shakespeare, except I don't think it works that way. Whatever. But yeah, sorry for like 
coughing and stuff. That sort of, and that also slowed me down. Basically, get more water, figure out better ways of doing it, and maybe learn how to spread. That would probably help instead of just reading it slightly faster than normal pace. Oh well, it was still a pretty good run. World record since I'm the only one. Okay. Uh, I'm going to end this now.